Hello everyone, and welcome to CIPS Contender, my complex regional pain syndrome education channel. Today's video is food for thought, thoughts on food, CRPS, and an anti-inflammatory diet. Now before we get into talking about the actual diet part of this, I want to set some groundwork so that it makes more sense. People with CRPS often experience digestive issues. So we're going to start with everyone's favorite thing, statistics. Now these numbers are including acute cases. These are the cases that last less than a year of being active, but realistically we're actually talking about cases that last less than six months before the body switches from sympathetically maintained pain to sympathetically independent pain. Now, if you are unfamiliar with either of those terms, I recommend you go ahead and check out one of my other videos. 41% of CRPS patients experience constipation. 23% of CRPS patients experience nausea, with 12% experiencing vomiting, 19% experiencing diarrhea, 19% experiencing indigestion, 17% being diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome, and 17% having dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing. Now, again, those numbers are including all CRPS cases. However, once you get into chronic cases, these numbers change significantly. Patients with active CRPS for five or more years generally have full body multi limb CRPS. Now, if you've watched any of my other videos and you've seen where we've covered how CRPS is actually malfunction of your immune system and your nervous system, you can see that this makes perfect sense because CRPS does not actually in the long term have much to do with your original area of injury. It has to do with your nervous system. Usually the lower limbs are more greatly affected than the upper limbs and urological issues, which is relieving yourself of urine, your kidneys, your bladder, your urethra, your uterus, have problems. This accompanies gastroparesis. Now gastroparesis is having an inactive or underactive contractions of your stomach muscle. This is what sends your food through your digestive system, and this is likely caused by vagus nerve dysfunction. If you would like, again, a more detailed explanation of that, check out my autoinflammation and autoimmunity mini series. Let's see how these numbers change from the broader acute case numbers. 90 plus percent. 90 plus percent. That's a huge number. 90 plus percent of CRPS patients with long-term active CRPS experience irritable bowel-like syndromes. This includes severe constipation, chronic diarrhea, severe cramping and extreme abdominal pain, feeling full without having eaten much, and bloating, which comes from gas, digestive gases that gets trapped in your digestive tract and is unable to exit. Why does this happen? CRPS causes autonomic nervous system dysfunction via chronic inflammation. Now, it does other things as well, but this is the area we want to focus on is your autonomic nervous system. Your autonomic nervous system is usually split into, well, usually it's split into two, but it actually is split into three. The first one is your sympathetic nervous system. This controls your systemic mobilization responses. This is your fight or flight responses, the things that help you deal with threats and get you away from life-threatening situations. We are not going to discuss that system today. The second system is the parasympathetic nervous system. This system is control of your systemic maintenance responses, your feed and breed, your rest and digest, the things that you do to keep your body in good shape while you are feeling safe. And then the third one here is your enteric nervous system. This is in control of your gastrointestinal motility responses. This is the movement and function of your digestive tract. Now, lots of people are not familiar with the enteric system. That's totally understandable. It is not as studied as one could hope. There is studying being done on it, but right now we're still kind of in that learning stage. Your enteric system is also known as your gut brain. It is a mesh-like system that runs from throat to your sphincter, and it controls your digestive activity. Now, it is receiving information both from your autonomic nervous system and your vagus nerve. However, it can and does function independently of your brain and your spinal cord. So if for some reason your enteric system were to be separated from any nervous system input from your spinal cord, it could still do its job. That is a very important thing to note. Your enteric system contains 500% more neurons than your spinal cord, but that is only half a percent of the neurons in your brain. 
It also contains 90% of your body's serotonin and 50% of your body's dopamine. These are neurotransmitters that are responsible for many bodily functions. Because people with CRPS can experience these really horrendous digestive problems, there are many who are like, oh, okay, well, dietary change might help solve some of these problems. And they are absolutely correct. A dietary change can really improve your quality of life. Some of the diets that I've seen thrown around that people consider when they have CRPS are the ketogenic diet, which is a low carb, high fat diet, the paleo style diet, which is a hunter gatherer type of diet, also known as the stone age diet. This avoids agricultural consumption. Your vegetarian diet, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, but this avoids consumption of products produced by animal slaughter. Taking a step further, you go to veganism, which is avoiding consumption of all products produced by animals, which would include things like eggs, dairy, and honey. Raw foodism, which is consuming uncooked, unprocessed food. Mediterranean-style diet, which is a plant-based diet that has low saturated fats and low red meat intake. A gluten-free diet, which avoids gluten present in barley, rye, and wheat. DASH style diet, which is a dietary approach to stop hypertension. This is here to reduce your blood pressure. Liquid only diet, which means you are not consuming solid food. This might include things like smoothies or juices. For people who are experiencing anorexia, which is simply the medical termination for having an aversion to food or not being hungry. This is not the same thing as the dysmorphic anorexia nervosa, which is a body image issue thing. But if you are experiencing anorexia, this might be the only way you are getting any nutrients whatsoever. I am not at all trying to crap on this because I am I am well aware that sometimes this is the only way you can get what you need to continue on. I do want to offer an alternative. And then finally, the elimination diet, which is finding things that are irritating your system and just removing them from your diet without really changing anything else. Before we get into the diet I would like to recommend, which is the anti-inflammatory diet, I want to talk a little bit about the transitive property of food intake. When we consume food, our body breaks it down and uses the nutrients in it to create more cells and give us energy and you know propagate our continued existence. That means that we are what we eat. I'm sure you've all heard that old adage. It is very, very true. And those who have no time for healthy eating will sooner or later find time for illness. If you have CRPS, you are well aware that we cannot control everything that's going on in our lives, but we are in complete control of what we put into our bodies and what we consume. The food we eat will either make us more or less healthy. Those are the choices. When discussing the anti-inflammatory diet, I want to be clear that this is not a short-term diet. It is a long-term lifestyle change. This is not the same thing as trying to lose 20 pounds in three months and then being done. This is something that will greatly increase your freedom, greatly increase your ability to do things. It will increase your energy. It will reduce your pain, but it is something that will need to be continued. This is about creating healthy habits not restrictions. If you go into this with the mindset that you are creating a prison for yourself or other similar thought processes and beating yourself up constantly and bashing yourself over the head because, oh, well, I didn't follow that very strictly, you know, now I'm suffering and that's, you know, I'm a horrible human being and I've brought this on myself and yada, 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 yada. You could do that, but why? This is about making you feel better. And if you are constantly making yourself feel bad, well, then you're just, it's counterproductive, okay? So I would encourage you to look at this diet as something freeing, as something liberating, as something that helps give you some control over something that you really have no control over. With that out of the way, let's look at food as medicine. Silent inflammation is chronic low-grade inflammation that is present in many sorts of diseases, but is also present in CRPS, especially the later stages of CRPS. Now, in the early phases of CRPS, inflammation is quite apparent, but as the disease continues on down its path, it becomes trickier to see because it is less focused on what is externally visible and more focused on the degradation of your nervous system, which can be far more debilitating but much harder to see, to notice, to get treatment for. Gene expression is the process of getting information that is stored in your DNA and changing it into a functional biological product that you can use in your daily life. 
gene expression allows a cell to adjust to its environment and to participate in certain functions or behaviors. Gene expression reveals the state of a biological system at any given time. Gene silencing is the, the regulation and control of genes in a cell to prevent or reduce gene expression, which means preventing or reducing certain cell functions and behaviors. Understanding the impact of an anti-inflammatory diet on silent inflammation can elevate the diet from simply a source of calories to being on the cutting edge of gene silencing technology. In plain English, that means your diet can change the behavior of your body. Now, let's get into what the anti-inflammatory diet consists of. Now, to be clear, I want to be upfront about this. This is more a a method, a sense of principles. This is not a strict, you must do this, you must do that. These are guidelines to help you find the best way to be healthy and to feel good, to feel improved, to not be in so much pain. This is a set of guidelines. You could, of course, get quite strict with it, and there are many variations of this kind of diet. But I am here to give you information so that you can create your own path towards healing and wellness. So with that out of the way, let's discuss the anti-inflammatory diet. The most important thing you can do is avoid white sugar. I'm serious. That is the most important thing to cut out of your diet. White sugar is highly inflammatory and causes many, many problems for people with anti-inflammatory conditions. This is also a particularly tricky one because white sugar, at least in the United States, is just in everything. It is everywhere. It is very, very difficult to find something that does not have a bunch of white sugar in it and be positive that it is not in there unless you are making it yourself. Specifically, the kind of sugar we are trying to avoid here is sucrose, which is cane sugar, the granulated sugar, the powdered sugar, specifically white sugar. Brown sugar does not seem to quite have this same effect. It would, of course, be better to cut brown sugar out of the diet as well. But if you are like me and you enjoy your sweeties, an easy, simple option to cut white sugar out of your diet is just replace it with brown sugar. You can also use honey or fructose, which is the sugars that are naturally occurring in fruits. Those are perfectly fine to ingest. Brown sugar might cause you a bit of problems as well, but nowhere near the level and intensity that white sugar will cause. You should also avoid refined foods. These are foods that have been stripped of their nutrients and fiber. Because your digestive system does not work properly, you are having a much more difficult time getting the nutrients out of food that you are ingesting. So it is best to have food that is nutrient dense and has fiber in it. You should also avoid processed foods. Now, when I say processed foods here, I am meeting moderately to heavily processed. If you're going to the grocery store and you're buying anything in a bag, that is processed food because it is not, you know, straight out of ground. Um, I, that's not the kind of food I'm talking about. If your lettuce comes prepackaged and pre-cut, you know, whatever. I am talking about foods that have lots of added ingredients, pre-made pizzas, the frozen foods, things with lots of preservatives in it. That is the kind of food I'm talking about here. You should also avoid alcohol. Remember we were discussing, or really just brushing against the urological issues? That involves your kidneys. If your kidneys are not working properly, you're going to have problems. So just do yourself a favor, avoid alcohol. You should minimize your saturated fat intake. Saturated fats are fats that are solid at room temperature, like meat fat or butter. You should also minimize your trans fat intake. Trans fats are liquid oils that have been hydrogenated into solids. You might say, hey, this is a bit hypocritical of you. You are just telling me this is not about restrictions and here you are telling me all these things I cannot eat. It really depends on your matter of perspective. You could see these things as, oh yes, the delectable tidbits of life that I cannot do without and if I cut them out, I am depriving myself of a great source of joy. But are you really? Is the pleasure you get from eating these foods greater than the pain you experience from your digestive problems? That's a question only you can answer. In my experience, this is more like pulling glass out of a foot. Yes, the glass is in your foot, but it is causing you pain. It is not helping you. You are only doing yourself a favor by removing it from your body and allowing your body to heal itself. If the glass stays in your foot, you're gonna have an infection, and you're gonna make your problem worse, and you're never going to get better. With that out of the way, let's talk about what 
what you should be eating. What are things that are good for you to help improve your quality of life? Plenty of fresh fruits and vegetables. A good source of omega-3 fatty acids. A good source of whole grains. A source of lean protein. A variety of spices. And a reduction of red meats and full-fat dairy. Let's discuss fruits and veg in a bit more detail. What kinds of fruits and vegetables should you be looking for? All fresh, dried, frozen, dehydrated fruits or vegetables, unsweetened juices, and smoothies. Things you should avoid would be canned fruits or vegetables, especially fruits that are suspended in syrup, sweetened, candied, or processed fruits and vegetables. Now, in some styles of anti-inflammatory diets, grains are removed altogether. If you like your breads and you want to keep grains in there, you should be looking for whole wheat, brown rice, oatmeal, cracked wheat, rye, popcorn, barley, quinoa, buckwheat, maize, millet, spelt, sorghum, amaranth. You should avoid any white flour. You should cut white flour out entirely. Those are going to include refined, enriched, bleached, milled, or processed flours. This is also going to include pastry dough. Now, phyllo dough is still good because it doesn't have white sugar in it. Other sorts of pastries you should cut out. Lean protein. Good sources of lean pro protein are poultry, fish and seafood, including shrimp, oysters, crabs, and the like, eggs, nuts and seeds, including things like almonds, walnuts, chia, sesame, flax, sunflower, pumpkin, nut spreads like almond butter, those kinds of things, legumes like beans, peas, lentils, tofu, and tempa. You should avoid bacon, fatty meats, processed meats, hot dogs, salami, bologna, those styles of meats. Now, these are things that you don't need to cut from your diet. Now, of course, if you want to, by all means, give it a shot. But if you enjoy your steak, you like your cheese, you don't want to get rid of that, here are some things to consider. You don't need to entirely remove them, but all things in moderation. Red meat, you should look for low-fat cuts. Things like eye of round, sirloin tip, top sirloin, top round, bottom round. You should avoid things labeled prime cuts, things with visible fat or marbling, a high fat percentage, or organ meats. For full fat dairy, you should look for fermented or cultured sources like yogurt, cream, cheese, sour cream. Now with cheese, you should look for more mild cheeses. The sharp cheeses have other things in there that are not going to be great for people with CRPS. You should avoid things like butter, ice cream, and sweetened condensed milk. If you're like me, this one's going to be really tough, but it does greatly improve the quality of life. Spices. Look for things with anti-inflammatory properties like turmeric, ginger, cinnamon, garlic, cayenne pepper, black pepper, red pepper, cloves, cardamom, fennel, cumin, fenugreek, onion, rosemary, and mustard. This kind of diet is probably going to incorporate a lot of cooking for yourself. This is something that can be quite pleasurable, uh, but it does take some practice. So I encourage you to you know, get in the kitchen, figure things out, find what you like, and find what's best for you. And I do want to talk a little bit more about omega-3 fatty acids. These are polyunsaturated fatty acids. You might also see these called PUFAs, omega-3 oils. There are three kinds of omega-3 fatty acids in human physiology. You have ALA, which is found in plant oils. Mammals are unable to create this, and so it can only be obtained through your diet. However, it is essential. You must, you must have an appropriate amount so that you can use it to create other things. This type of Omega-3 fatty acid can also be used to create the other two types, which are EPA and DHA. Both of these are found in marine oils, like fish, and DHA in particular is abundant in brain matter. Why does it matter? What do you need it for? What does it do? Omega-3 fatty acids are an important part of the breakdown and storage of fats for energy, the construction of healthy cell membranes and walls, the proper function of cell receptors in those walls, your hormonal balance, your genetic function regulation, the regulation of blood pressure and heart rhythm, and the reduction of inflammation. Now remember, CRPS is chronic inflammation of the nervous system. So this is particularly helpful to combat that. Now we have discussed quite a bit of content here in this video today. We have talked about overall statistics of digestive dysfunction in people with CRPS and specifically those with chronic CRPS. Why digestive system dysfunction happens 
and an introduction to the enteric system. We have talked about several different kinds of several different kinds of diets, as well as silent inflammation and gene expression. We've talked about the transitive property of food and anti-inflammatory diet, including whole foods, moderated foods, and omega-3 fatty acids. Again, I want to encourage you not to view this as a restriction, but rather as a method of self-liberation. This is easily something you can do for yourself without the need of a doctor to validate your pain or your condition without spending a ton of money or having to go through your insurance. You can do this on your own. You don't need anyone's permission to do this for yourself and it will significantly increase the quality of life and the amount of energy you have to expend on other activities. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like to contribute to my medical expenses, my Patreon is CRPS Contender. The relevant sources are linked in the description below. I hope you learned something today, and I hope to see you next time. Hello everyone, and welcome to CRPS Contender.